Hey everyone and welcome to my channel. Before we get into today's case, I would just like to give you a bit of a warning because the victim of this one is a child. I won't be going into massive detail about the actual crime itself, but it is hard to listen to. So if that's not something that you feel like you can watch right now, that's absolutely fine. You can click off and go watch something a bit nicer. If you are interested, then let's get into today's case. So Polly Hannah Class was born January 3rd, 1981 to her parents, Mark Class and Eve Nichol. At the time of Polly's abduction, she actually lived in Petaluma, California with her mum after her parents had divorced. So on October 1st, 1993, when Polly was 12 years old, she had two friends over called Kate and Gillian and they were just having a sleepover like all 12 year olds do. They were playing board games and trying on Halloween costumes. So being typical 12 year old kids by the time the gals started to get tired Polly's mum had actually already fallen asleep and was just down the hall. At around 10 30 or 11 p.m Polly decided that she needed to go get the sleeping bags for the other girls to sleep on. As she opened her bedroom door to the hallway she saw a tall man stood there with a knife and a duffel bag. He quickly told the girls not to scream or he'd cut their throats and then asked who lived in the house to which Polly responded that she did. He then tied up all three girls with bits of white cloth and Nintendo cards and put pillowcases over the head. He then grabbed Polly and said to the Kate and Gillian to count to a thousand and by the time that they had finished counting Polly would be back. After the girls had managed to get out of the restraints they quickly ran down the hall to wake up Polly's mum screaming that Polly was gone and that a man had taken her. And then Polly's mum Eve rang the police at 11.03pm. Now initially when police started questioning the girls they thought that it could be like an elaborate prank that they were pulling but then the panic on the girls faces quickly told them that this wasn't true. The FBI was called straight away and then police sent out an alert but remember that this was the early 90s so there wasn't such a thing as an amber alert and this was just a radio broadcast to all police cars in the area telling them that a child had gone missing. Now they started canvassing the neighbourhood and they actually spoke to one of the neighbours who said that around 10 30 that night he'd seen a man just walk up the driveway right into the class's house but because of like the calm demeanour of this man and the way that he just walked straight into the house he assumed that it was a family friend or someone that was staying in the house and it didn't didn't alert him at all. Now because of what this neighbour saw and by the fact that most child abductions are done by somebody that knows the family Mark Class, Polly's dad, was actually an initial suspect in the case. So they got Mark into the station, started questioning him, and they did a polygraph test, which he passed. So then they cleared him from the investigation and he was no longer a suspect. And instead, the case was turned to focus on more of a stranger abduction. So crime scene investigators went into the house and they found a palm print on Polly's bunk bed in her bedroom and this wasn't matched to a family member or anyone that had visited the home recently. So like I said this was the early 90s which meant that there was no database for palm prints so that print could only be matched to someone that was an existing suspect it couldn't be matched to like think like fingerprints are nowadays. So they got a sketch artist to come and speak to Kate and Gillian who had obviously seen the man quite well and they described him as a white guy with facial hair wearing a yellow bandana. Polly's case was actually the first case to use the internet to kind of spread awareness and her missing persons poster was put online and shared over two billion times. So missing persons posters were put out and tapes playing information about the case were spread everywhere and also t-shirts with Polly's face on just in the hope that someone would recognise and maybe know where she'd gone. 4,000 volunteers helped with the search for Polly and air support was actually brought in which searched 3,000 miles of land looking for her. The actress Winona Ryder actually set up a 200,000 dollar reward for anyone that gave information leading to the discovery of Polly. So one day Mark Class's brother-in-law was watching over Mark's house and he got a call from somebody claiming to be Polly saying that they were being held in a hotel room. The person on the other end of the phone said that the person that kept them would be back soon and then hung up. Please put a tap on the phone so that if they call again it could be traced and they actually did call again. The call was traced to Hayward which was a city quite close to where Polly lived. I think it was about 25 miles away. Only when police arrived at the hotel it it was actually the home of a middle class family that had a teenage girl who said that she'd been dared to make the phone calls by her friends. Now he'd actually call them on the police phones which do track location automatically and as they traced the phone call back to this guy's house it was just a hoax and he just wanted the ransom money and he was arrested. Soon after this guy's arrest Vallejo police actually contacted the Petaluma police to report a potential suspect. This man was caught breaking into the home of a single mother and a 12 year old girl wielding a knife and a rape kit. Now he 
became a huge suspect because of the similarities of the two cases, but there was no evidence to actually link him to Polly's case, so that they had to let that go. So police actually received another tip from an FBI informant who said that Polly was being held in Northern California in a cabin by drug dealers as part of a revenge kidnapping. In the middle of the night, SWAT teams went to this cabin and as they were about to enter, they actually got a call from the FBI saying that this was a hoax and that the FBI informant had just made it all up. On November 28th, after so many false leads and false hope, Dana Jaffe actually called the police reporting some suspicious items that she'd found on her property. She'd found rope bindings which looked like they'd been used to tie somebody up. Now Dana had actually already called the police on the night of Polly's abduction reporting a suspicious man on her property. So police sent out Larry Pelton who was a detective that had actually been on the initial crime scene in Polly's bedroom. Outside Dana's house he actually found white strips of cloth that matched the ones that the girls had been tied up with in Polly's bedroom. He also found some torn ballet tights which matched some that Polly had in her wardrobe. So police looked back on Dana's initial call on the night of Polly's abduction. So Dana's nanny had actually been leaving for the night and as she was leaving she saw a man stood on the private road that led to the Jaffe house and he was inside the fenced off property. She drove to a nearby gas station to tell Dana what had happened and Dana immediately got out of the house. She ran to the car and put both of her kids in the car and then just drove off so she could call the police. When police responded and went to the house they actually found a guy called Richard Allen Davis standing next to his rusty Ford pin which had come off the road and gone into a ditch. Police said he was sweaty, short of breath and he had leaves and twigs in his hair. Now what's really really frustrating is that these police weren't even aware of the description of the man that the two girls had actually created earlier as it was put on a radio broadcast and they weren't on the same frequency as they were from the same area. They weren't even aware that Polly was missing like this wasn't even a case that was on their radar to them. Now this guy, I'm just going to call him Davis for the purposes of this video, said that he had actually been sightseeing and his car had run off into a ditch. Police believed him as they searched his name and he had no outstanding warrants and they actually had no reason to check his priors. If they did check his prior convictions then they would have realised that he had actually been charged with kidnapping twice before. So Dana Jaffe, the homeowner, said that she didn't want to press charges so police just made Davis swear never to go on a property again and then released him. Now police, remembering all of this that happened that night and the fact that they'd found the ballet tights on that property, decided to search up the name and driving license of the man that they'd stopped that night. Now when Davis's picture popped up they instantly recognised it because it was so so similar to the sketch that the two girls had described that night. So since Polly's abduction he'd actually been in police hands twice. One night when he was on Dana Jaffe's property and the other one he was brought into the station after he'd been caught driving under the influence. Now the second time when he was driving he actually got pulled into the station and in the jail where he was sat on the walls was his police sketch and nobody kind of like made the connection. So his prior convictions were actually once in 1976 where he had kidnapped a woman and sexually assaulted her when he was claiming to be hearing voices and he served five years for this. In 1984 he abducted another woman and stole $6,000 from her. He served eight years this time and was paroled in June 1993, which was just four months before Polly was abducted. So after police had kind of realised all these connections about his prior crimes and the fact that he was at Dana's house where the evidence was found, they decided to set up intense surveillance on Davis. Two days went by and Davis hadn't really done anything suspicious, so police just decided to arrest him there and then. They actually took Davis's palm print, which matched the one found on Polly's bed. So while Davis was in custody, he actually denied all knowledge about Polly's case. But then when police showed him the palm print and the fact that it matched his hand, he confessed. Four days after his arrest, he actually confessed to strangling Polly that very first night that she'd been abducted. He led police to Polly's makeshift burial site, which was off Highway 101 near Cloverdale. There they found the remains of Polly Class. So police had already started working up the timeline and they concluded that by the time that Dana Jaffe had seen Davis on her property, Polly was already deceased. Police also believe that this was premeditated and that this place had already been picked out in advance as it was not somewhere that you just kind of stumble upon. So as you can imagine, Eve and Mark were absolutely devastated. Apparently all Mark did when he found out about Polly was just sob in front of the fireplace. Eve had actually kept a candle lit every single day that Polly had been missing and on the day she found out about the news, she just blew the candle out. Now they finally had some closure about what happened to Polly and police actually did 
determined that this was a premeditated crime and that he had stalked Polly for weeks in advance. On June 18th, 1996, about two and a half years after Polly had been murdered, Davis was convicted of kidnapping and first degree murder. After hearing his sentence, he turned to the jury, winked, blew a kiss and then stuck up his two middle fingers. He's now on death row and is an inmate at the San Quentin State Prison. At the time of my sources, I'm not quite sure about what he's doing now, but he actually was in solitary confinement after he took an intentional overdose and after he was attacked by other prisoners. Now, in honour of her life and memory, Mark Class actually set up the Class Kids Foundation. This is dedicated to help find missing kids and also support those that have been affected by crime against children. Now, I'll leave the link in the bio so you can go have a look, donate and see what amazing things they're doing. And that sums up today's case. Now, it is just extremely sad but I guess they've got some closure after finding who did it. If you'd like to see more videos like this, then please subscribe to my channel and leave me a thumbs up below. You can also comment below whether you'd like me to do a solved or unsolved next week, because it's kind of up in the air. I decide the case is about like three days before or something like that. It's not very far in advance. So if you could leave me any ideas or suggestions in the comments, that would be great. And I will see you next week. Bye guys.